No big family celebrations, no fireworks. In many countries this year, people have to forgo beloved traditions because the pandemic is spiraling out of control. Here in Germany, that means lockdown until January 10th at the earliest. Non-essential shops are closed, Christmas markets have gone dark, nightly curfews and alcohol bans apply in places, and schools are shut. The US, Canada and the United Kingdom have become vaccinating, but their vulnerable citizens still face grave risk. Yet things could be different. Countries like Ireland imposed tough lockdowns much earlier and are now reaping the benefits. Our title, COVID-19 crisis, who pays when the politicians get it wrong? Hello and welcome to To The Point. And it's a pleasure to greet our guests. Matthew Konichig is the chief Europe correspondent for Politico. And he says Germany's COVID-19 policy is economically exactly what the doctor ordered. The new lockdown in the quiet season couldn't have been better. And it's a pleasure to welcome Julia Fischer. She is a Berlin-based journalist and physician who reports on science and medicine for radio broadcasters. And her opinion, this year, beloved traditions can have life-threatening consequences. Everyone who does not attend big get-togethers saves lives. And it's great to have Derek Scully on the program again. He is a correspondent based here in Berlin with the Irish Times, and he says, Ireland did it right in the second wave. After a six-week lockdown, the Irish are looking forward to a relatively relaxed Christmas and New Year. So, Matthew, let me start out by coming back to the quiet season, because it's certainly not a quiet season for medical personnel and for many people working in clinics and, uh, of course, intensive care units. More and more, are under strain here in Germany. What happened? Well, I think the government took overall a fairly flexible approach over the last several months in Germany because they didn't want to have a hard lockdown like we've seen in other countries in Europe, in France, in Belgium, Italy, and so forth. One reason is because the effects that that has on the economy. And yes, now the numbers are rising in Germany. But if you look back over the past six months, and if you look at how the German economy has performed, and it's outperformed most of Europe, it's done surprisingly well with, for example, in the third quarter alone, the um, GDP rising by over 8%, which surprised everybody. I think you have to look at the entire picture here and say, you know, Yes, they could have done a full lockdown and we would be in a better place right now at Christmas than we would have otherwise. But there are also other effects of a lockdown that people, I think, often forget, particularly on mental health and, um, you know, on schools and, and so forth. So I think that overall Germany should uh, get pretty good grade here. Thank you very much. Uh, we will come back to the economic side in just a minute. But, uh, Yulia, you say beloved traditions can have life-threatening consequences. So clearly you think that the situation here is pretty dire. Yes. Um, and I think right now it really is important to really reduce uh, the contacts that we're having because that is the one thing the virus really attacks. Uh, unfortunately, it's the one thing that, that we really like. We really want to be together with other people. But this, uh, this time, we really just have to make sure not to see anybody who's not within our epidemiologic bubble unless we can really quarantine before or something. But we really have to watch out this year. So actually, there are some restrictions, or before these tighter rules, there were some restrictions that had been put in place in mid-November, a so-called lockdown light that was supposed to be a circuit breaker to really break through that chain of infections. But it hasn't turned out that way. Why not? It hasn't worked as, as the politicians had hoped, because I think um, they hoped that the people in Germany would act accordingly to those rules more strictly. We know that in March, people reduced their mobility by 60%, and they only reduced them um, to 40% this time. And that is just not enough. So we saw that um, different than in Ireland, for example, people didn't work in the home office enough. They did travel with public transport a lot and things like that. So. 
in a whole that was not able to really reduce the, the number as hoped in the beginning. Derek Scully, you pointed out that Ireland did handle the second wave differently. So two questions about that. First one, how stable is the current situation there? I was checking some news reports. It looks like it's not quite clear if the infection rate may be trending upward again. Exactly. I mean, I look at these lockdowns, it's a bit like cortisone cream. You can put it on the rash, the rash will go away. The question is how quickly will the rash come back up and how do you tackle the underlying cause? So these lockdowns are only ever measures, but it's almost like when do we need the breathing space? When do we need the breathing space and timing it accordingly? And I mean, the Irish Christmas is extremely important. Millions of immigrants like to come home. Many of them won't make it, but for at least people in Ireland, they've had a very tough year. They didn't have the breathing space in the summer the way we had in Germany. So to not give them the Christmas, there would have been a revolt. So I think they just counted backwards from Christmas six weeks and they said, let's do it. But as you said this morning, the chief medical officer in Ireland is worried. Um, things are creeping up again. But I mean, the numbers, the comparable number is they're at 48 cases per 100,000 over seven days. So in parts of Saxony and Eastern Germany, they're at 700. So, and in Germany, I think it's like 106, 170. So we're still a long way, but yeah, it's gonna creep up. And people are already saying, is the price of our Christmas, we're gonna be locked down in January again. But as people would say, hmm, if I had a choice, I think January, everyone's maxed out their credit cards anyway. Sitting at home in January is what they do best. So um, <laughs> maybe it would be less painful then. So yeah, a lot of governments are just making plans, but I, I did see what Ireland, they had a calendar in front of them, they counted backwards. And in Germany, they just seemed to have like, oh right, yeah, Christmas, forgot about that. And now we're sort of facing into this. And for retailers, for families to be told with two days notice, oh, by the way, Christmas shopping is canceled. I mean, the panic, uh, having people panicking, running into shops, grabbing whatever they could in the middle of a pandemic really doesn't seem very smart. And they knew Christmas was coming. Matthew, if you compare, say, the way that Germany handled the first wave um, to how it's handling the second one, do you see a change in the way that politicians have behaved here in this country? I would say I see more a difference in the way the population has behaved because people seem to be much less worried about corona now than they were in March because they didn't have the visibility. When something happens for the second time, you tend to be less worried about it if you've survived the, the first stage. And I think that's what's happened here where most people understand that you know, even if they get it, their chances of dying are not that high. And, you know, they know what they need to do to avoid getting it. Back in March, the whole situation with the masks, for example, wasn't really clear if that was good or not. There was just a lot of confusion about it. So I think, you know, people tend to blame the politicians, but I think that we all know now, and we knew back in March, that there was going to be a second wave. There's always a second wave. There was with the Spanish influenza in 1918, and there is now. Do you think I think that's right, Yulia. Would you say actually politicians do bear part of the responsibility? Certainly there was some criticism about mixed signals that had been sent here in Germany, say, uh, when rates started trending upward again in early October. Yeah, and I think that is the that was definitely a problem. I mean, it's I think also it's very true that people are getting used um, to the virus and that because there's still a lot of people who don't know anybody who really got very sick from the virus or anything. I think that that helps people or, or makes people um, underestimate the danger of the virus much more than it was in, in uh, spring. And I think that's a big problem. But I also think it would be the duty of the politicians to communicate in a better and clearer way that the danger is still there and that we have um, that we have to act together to do something against this pandemic. And I think sometimes in some parts of the country that went wrong. Derek, um, whether or not Ireland is the perfect example, certainly some countries do apparently do better than others. New Zealand, Taiwan, some other places in Asia. To what extent do you think that the approaches in such countries are transferable to others? Are there recipes here in terms of political guidance, communication, mm. and so on? No, I think the social element is, is crucial. I mean, and it's also what works at what point. Uh, you know, the German approach, they had the, they were able to test quickly. They had the capacity early on, tracking and tracing. That, and they were also decentralized, so they could act locally. And in this particular phase, the decentralized approach appears to work less. I think a crucial issue is um, how much can a state expect of its people? And um, I don't know enough about Asia, but people have said that there's a higher level of compliance with, you know, an order comes and people are more willing. 
uh, in Western Europe is more notion of personal freedom. You know, you are infringing on my personal freedom. I've been, I'm entitled to uh, celebrate Christmas as I wish. In Ireland, what I found interesting, what I found fascinating was the level of social control is so much higher there than here in Germany. Um, there's a, Meaning? People, um, people could be shamed into doing things more quickly. I mean, shame was to, taken out. It was like an instinctive uh, Irish Catholic holdover. I don't know what, but people could be shamed into staying at home. Oh, you're going abroad. It was never illegal to go abroad, but if you were going abroad, you would hear about it from your neighbours afterwards. So, again, that's not sustainable, but it's certainly in the first stages it worked. And there's a sort of a social, social cohesion. Um, I notice in Germany things seem to be, at least in Berlin, which is not Germany, but um, a much more individualistic approach. You know, there's a notion of society but this the people aren't as close to each other so the consequences of your personal decisions perhaps are not as immediately apparent to you or you care less about the people in your immediate environment who could be affected by your personal choices let's drill a little bit deeper on the economic side of the pandemic the difficult trade-off that we face is of course not only about foregoing beloved traditions but also very much about material costs. Germany's new lockdown will have severe consequences for retailers in particular. Let's go to Nuremberg, known for a Christmas market whose magic has now abruptly come to an end. Golden Angels, mulled wine shopping, the epitome of German Christmas, especially at the world-famous Christkindlesmarkt in Nuremberg. This year, it's cancelled. Only a few stalls are open, selling fruit and vegetables to the handful of customers. There's no Christmas here. There are no tourists anymore. It's just plain bad. As you can see, the market is completely quiet. People should only leave their homes in urgent cases. Alcohol is banned in public places. And there's no nighttime curfew, all enforced by the police. Germany hesitated to impose a hard lockdown for a long time, and it was preceded by an unusually emotional appeal from the Chancellor. If we have too much contact over Christmas and it turns out to be the last one with our grandparents, we would have failed, and that is something we should not do. In fact, according to surveys, around 70% of Germans are in favor of a hard lockdown. But how long can people hold out? And let me ask Matthew Karnikjig exactly that question, because your opening statement indicates that you think Germans are in a good position to bear the costs. But the Retailers Association here in Germany says that as many as one in two retailers could wind up facing bankruptcy if they don't get enough help quickly. Well, fortunately, Germany isn't primarily a retail economy. And I think people often forget this because... You know, when you go out on the street, what you see are shops, and when uh, shops are suffering, that's something that's more immediate to most people. But it is and has always been an industrial economy. It lives from exports, and that has continued. German exports to China and elsewhere in Asia are back up again recently. So I think this is what the government has really focused on, and that's why I think that being more flexible over the past several months has been a good idea because this is a crucial phase for most industrial companies, the end of the year, in particular, the fourth quarter. And so while retailers are hurting, I mean, the lockdown started on uh, December the 16th, so they're going to lose maybe a week or so uh, of their normal business, which is also a crucial time of year for them. But overall, I think the trade-off is probably worth it because if you had started the lockdown earlier, closing schools, for example, that would have had a much more severe impact on the core of the German economy. Derek, the uh, German government says that it will help affected businesses uh, cover their fixed costs to the tune of another 11 billion euros a month, apparently from the public purse. The finance minister says that's okay. Germany can afford this astronomically high debt. Do you think that's right? Um, well, the, the finance minister in Germany, the federal finance minister, is a social democrat and coincidentally he wants to be elected chancellor next year. So, um, I mean, I think it's everyone wants to be the Christmas, everyone wants to be Santa Claus at the moment. But yeah, I've had friends who aren't in politics, aren't in finance, and they just said, where is this money coming from? Um, so if the man on the street is beginning to wonder where the money is coming from, 
rather than saying, isn't it great we're getting free money? Um, it's, it, that's worrying for me. And, and Germany, I suppose it can afford it more than other countries because for the last couple of years, it was almost like a religion here. They call it the Schwarze Null, the balance, but they wanted a black zero. The, the books had to be balanced. But um, suddenly in the, in the crisis, they've been able to, because their, ba their balance sheets were more balanced over the years, um, it's able, they're able to take money. But even by German standards, this is astronomical amounts of money. It'll be certainly interesting what they can promise next year, running up to the election, the federal elections in September if they've actually blown all the money now. Uh, Julia, looking at this trade-off between economic uh, burdens and um, the uh, burdens on health systems because of the pandemic, do you think there really are alternative approaches? I'm thinking about countries like Sweden or Switzerland, which tried hard to let normal life go on and essentially uh, that way preserve the openness of the economy. Those models essentially have failed, haven't they? Yeah, that didn't work. I mean, we saw that the Swedish had um, 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 many more deaths than we did and, and that the economy didn't live better than it did in Germany. So um, I think... It's always it's always very difficult to to balance these two options. But um, scientists know that if you have a hard lockdown and you keep it short but strict, normally it is good for the numbers and it doesn't hurt the economy as bad as if you if you keep low measure, measures or light measures for a long time. So I think um, doing a hard lockdown now and hoping that it can be short is better. Uh, than, yes, keeping it going on a, on a fairly high number. There is one model here in Germany that is sometimes seen as an alternative to the way that most states are doing things, and it's uh, coming from the fairly small southwestern town of Tübingen, where the authorities, Green Party politicians, have made a very big effort to protect the elderly and the vulner vulnerable, for example, by creating special times where only they can shop. Um, and meanwhile, allowing life otherwise to go on pretty much as normal. Would you say that is a model that could work elsewhere, at least in Germany? It is a nice model to really try to protect the elderly more, but it's never going to prevent the virus from getting to the, to the risk groups because people mingle and you always have young people working at hospitals or um, social care homes and stuff like that. So you're, it is a nice try and I'm sure it has a good effect, but it's not going to stop it's not going to stop the dynamic of the virus spreading also into the other groups. Matthew, in many ways, this discussion encapsulates what we saw in the United States, essentially in the tensions between a Donald Trump who said, just let the economy do its thing and uh, the, the pandemic will kind of uh, eventually fizzle out, to a Joe Biden who says the economy is never going to really get back on its feet until we get the pandemic under control. Which side would you come down on? Well, I think the economy is going to start prospering again in the coming months as the vaccination starts to roll out. We're seeing that already. I think we're seeing more optimism in the United States because of that. That's also reflected in the stock market, which is sort of a harbinger of sentiment going forward. Um, you know, Trump didn't manage the crisis well. It's clear if you look at the number of people who died in the United States with 300,000 now dead and uh, 3,000 dying every day as we uh, speak now. So I, I don't think that was a success. That said, the economy has performed better than in many other countries because there wasn't a uh, harsh lockdown. Um, and, you know, this, I think, is, is a situation that is different in every country. You have to listen to the people. There are different mentalities around the world. Obviously, China was very successful in combating the virus. They have methods, I think, that uh, most people in Europe would, would not accept. But they did succeed in bringing the pandemic under control very quickly. So I think you just have to be somewhat flexible starting with massive uh, surveillance and uh, use of private data. I want to come to the vaccine question in just a moment, but, Derek, one more um, um, political aspect, uh, and that is um, popular support for the measures. We saw in the report, and I've seen this myself, I was out on the streets yesterday talking to people, 70, 80 percent of Germans saying they support this new lockdown, they think tighter restrictions are important, should have maybe been put in place sooner. Merkel has seen her popularity skyrocket yet again since she's been calling for these harder measures. But the fact is, that is now. 
What is it likely to look like in six months or longer if people are losing their jobs, if retailers are uh, failing? Could we see a backlash in which people lose faith uh, in the politicians and perhaps turn to populism? Um, I think it's very likely. I mean, I find it interesting that there were enough people out on the streets yesterday to do a Vox Pop. I mean, technically, we're not supposed to be. I came here <laughs> through the Western city centre and I was expecting another sort of zombie film scenario, like in March, where just abandoned streets and a bit of rubbish blowing in the wind. People are out and about. And if you ask them, everyone has a good reason to be out. The question is, oh, yeah, well, of course, there are restrictions. So I think what we're seeing is this sort of cognitive distance in people's minds. Of course, I know there's restrictions, but I just need to, a bit like that person who parks in the second lane, I just need to, I just need to get my bread rolls. I just need to go to the bank machine. Um, so I think that exceptionalism, we all have this exceptionalism in our mind. And uh, I think that's growing. Uh, in, 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 in March, February, uh, March, April, people were just saying, no, I mean, there's no exceptions. We just have to do it. So we're already now in quite an elastic phase in our brains. And that could go on. And I, I don't really think the populism, I think it's more interesting in the Anglo Merkel's party, the Christian Democrats, they've, they're looking for a new leader. And it'll be interesting who wins there. Will it be a more authoritarian figure? Will it be more a, we need to, uh, like a Merkel figure? Um, we need to keep everyone together, an integrationist figure. So I think that will be key. We'll see that in the middle of, of, of January. And I think that will be an interesting barometer of where German public opinion is. This is the largest party. This person who's going to be elected is probably going to be the next chancellor. And they will set the tone, I think, for the debate. Let us now take a quick look at uh, pandemic uh, politics. Some countries that have largely failed to get the pandemic under control, such as the US and Britain, are now hoping that vaccination will put things right. The United Kingdom was the first country in Europe to approve BioNTech Pfizer's vaccine, and it is accelerating its rollout. Margaret Keenan, a 90-year-old woman from Coventry, made history as the first to be vaccinated. She's happy to have put COVID behind her and hopes that many will follow her example. Her shot kicked off the largest mass vaccination in British history. The elderly and nursing home staff are first in line for the vaccinations. Yulia, based on that British example, do you think that authorities here could and should have accelerated the approval process and rolled the vaccine out faster? I don't think so, because I think it's really important uh, to, to make the people see that this is um, a process that's really following protocol and that all the standards that need to be applied are applied and that the people can really trust if, if it's approved, this vaccine, um, they can trust that it's good. And uh, for that reason, I think it's, it's okay that it's taking a while. And Derek, uh, how fast would you expect Britain's program to show results? Do you think a quick rollout can begin to compensate for those failures that were in fact made by Johnson's government? I think he actually what we're seeing with the vaccine rollout is uh, sort of a cross infection Brexit realities. It's a disaster situation. Things are getting very tough. They needed some political um, they needed a good news story. So I would be very surprised if there weren't some phone calls made to say we actually need the vaccine and we need it now. Uh, and the health minister went on British television and was crying crocodile tears, how moving it was to see this. So I think there was a political reality to, to be that. And of course, there is a political reality of the deaths in Britain. I've been asking my British cousins, like, why is nobody talking about the death right here? I mean, this is like Grenfell and Hillsborough and all of the terrible disasters in Britain on a daily basis and he's not so yeah he's on political under political pressure to deliver uh, but in the long term it would be terrible if if for some reason this emergency um, um, al allowing the vaccine to come to an, an emergency rules if that backfires and public credibility is the credibility of the vaccine is undermined will he take the political responsibility for that knowing Boris Johnson I'd say probably not. Matthew, politicians here are warning that it's going to take a while for vaccines to truly bring the infection rates down. Um, Germany's health minister says we might see a return to normalcy in summer. Do you think that's right? Is it realistic? Certainly realistic. It might not be realistic to think that everything is going to open up again on January 10th, which is now the official end of the lockdown. That might need to be extended. But I think by the time summer comes around again, I expect uh, things will have calmed down by then. Hopefully the vaccine will have been rolled out to many people, not everybody who's going to need it, but will be on the right path. And I think uh, the world will look much different. And uh, Yulia, just because we're almost at the end of our show, let me come back to our title. We asked whether 
citizens must pay for politicians' errors. We have a long, hard winter before us, before that vaccine really does begin to show results. Um, what would you want to see from politicians here in Germany, but also in Europe as a whole, in terms of trying to keep people on track to keep the pandemic at least somewhat under control? Yeah, I really think it needs a, a Europe-wide and really clear strategy. We need to um, really formulate a goal that everybody is working to, to for towards, and then we need clear communications by the politicians, and we need the people to follow the rules and really act um, accordingly. Derek, last sentence, what would you want to see from leaders? Yeah, European Union solution, that's what Europe is here for. It doesn't, the virus doesn't care whether it's in Belgium or across the border an hour away in Cologne, and yet we're dealing at a national level, and that's catastrophic in the long term. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us. Thanks to you out there for tuning in. See you soon.